All right. Sorry about that. I'm going to start over again. Um, good morning. I am Bonnie Abramson. I'm the online education chairman for the United Square Dancers of America, and we're glad to have you here this morning. Um, this session is being recorded. Uh, if you haven't already done so, um, please rename yourself so that we know who you are and where you're from. Um, that's always just a nice thing for us. And then um, please use the chat to ask questions. Um, and don't unmute yourself unless we ask you to so that we can keep everything um, as clean as possible for the recording. Uh, we are thrilled this morning to have Mr. Mike Hogan. Most of you know who he is, but he is a square dance caller from Nebraska and is uh, a media coordinator, vice president with uh, iHeart Media. And he has been very, very involved in Caller Lab, the Caller Lab Board of Governors, and most importantly, the um, marketing plan um, and book that uh, Caller Lab created, which is available to you. Um, we are thrilled to have you here. And Mike, I'm going to let you tell more about yourself and share your screen because they don't want to listen to me. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Mike Hogan. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, uh, in, as far as the, the who I am, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've met almost everybody that's on here that I've seen so far. So, um, but just as a background, uh-oh, did I mess things up? Hold up. Everybody there? You still see me? And you can hear me. Okay, because my, my screen went wonky for a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, I have been a square dance caller since the age of 13. I'm 61. You do the math. Uh, so I've been through lots and lots of change and, and lack of change and all kinds of things in the square dance activity. And basically, bottom line is I have, you know, I have so many years of experience and, and working knowledge about that, about the square dance activity. Uh, for a career path, somewhere along the lines, I got into the media industry and I've been in that industry for about 30, going on 33 years here next month. Um, started out in the, in the accounting department, worked my way through lots of things, got into sales, got into management. And uh, today I am the market president for two of the markets that iHeart Media operates in. Most people think of iHeart as, broad, as broadcast radio, which is the base of our business. Um, I have eight radio stations that I manage between those two markets. But on top of that, iHeartMedia is, uh, it's actually North America's largest media corporation. We, we expand into any and every digital marketing vertical that you can imagine of and, and most that you've not even heard of before. So it's, it's a bit like herding cats for me to, to I, I don't parade around pretending I am the I am the marketing expert on this particular product or that particular product. As opposed to that, I have a lot of broad scale marketing fundamental, how do you do it? And then all of those little pieces of, of in the digital space, as an example, are all tools that you have available to help get create a plan to accomplish whatever your goals are. I do a lot more high level planning organizing, helping select the right marketing tools, um, helping to understand the management of your business and how not just advertising, but all the other pieces work into it. So that's me. That's who I am. And so uh, I know Mylene sent the note out and in that it said that this was um, – kind of a, a review of the Collar Lab Square Dance Marketing Manual with any updates and insights. And so I've gone with that because you can pick a uh, hundred different topics that I could easily spend an hour to an hour and a half talking about each one. And I actually Bonnie and I had a chat. And I was like, well, what exactly do you want me to talk about? Because uh, I've done, I just did a six hour marketing clinic for uh, folks up in Northern California, tied into a weekend out there. Uh, I've done some two day things. Uh, I'm sure I could do a week long. So when you look at 
uh, you look at what do I do for an hour? I was like, okay, give me a topic. So since that's what Mylene went out, uh, kind of put out in her, in her email, I'm going to stick to that. Um, which be, I also know that there's not, a, this, this isn't a large group right now, which is kind of nice. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have that because I'd be interested in hearing how many of you actually have downloaded uh, from whatever source you got it, the Caller Lab Square Dance Marketing Manual. I know Bonnie has, of course. Uh, I I know Jim Magico has. I'm not sure who all, who all else has. So there may be some people on here that um, it's completely new to them. There's others that have probably downloaded it. Usually what I find is when dancers and callers download it, they don't read it. And what I mean by that is it has a uh, it has an index. And they decide when they download it that they, I'm just going to use a scenario, that they want to read up on how do I use Facebook. And so they look at the index and they find the, the uh, page that has talks about Facebook and they go to that. And there's so much fundamental and exercise sizes to do and background of knowledge of how a business runs and what how you should be looking at running the business of square dancing that just doesn't get read. So, you know, I'm going to go through some of that. Uh, I'm going to assume that most of you have probably seen the, the uh, document. Uh, and then we're going to talk about updates and what insights I have, which are very few, but we'll talk about that. What I would ask you to do is that when I talk about the content and updates and some of those kinds of things, if you have a pen handy and something crosses your mind that's not in the document that you would like to know more about, um, I'd like you to write it down because... Um, I came up with a list, but there may be some things in there that, that you would benefit from. Uh, and I'm happy to suggest to the committee that uh, in the overhaul of that of that document that we include some of that information. Fair enough? Okay. So now let's see if I can get... Oh, wait, 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 wait. I have to share screen. Share screen. And here's that and I'll share it and it does look like the uh, pow my powerpoint is now on screen except now it's covering up oh hold on here we go slideshow there we go all right document uh so this this is not the document it's a powerpoint presentation about the document um i do have the document on my laptop of course but i'm not I, it's it's a very long document so i want to tell you first of all we're going to start with um, the presentation, how the document exists now. And I want to highlight some of the things that are actually in it so that if you did do what I think a lot of people do, which is look at the index and go figure out you know, what particular tactic you want to know more about, this will uh, give me the chance to tell you a little bit more about why you should spend some time in the top, in the front half of the book, if you will. Okay. Uh, I get a lot of credit. A lot of people go, uh, Mike Hogan wrote this document. So I do, I do want to give some credit to some of the other folks who um, also contributed. So this was a, this was a task uh, that I created as chairman of the Caller Lab Marketing Committee, which I was for um, several years up until about two years ago, so two and a half years ago, somewhere in there. Um, 
and that's relative to the job change where I actually went from being an account executive with iHeart to a market president. And so when that happened now, five and a half years ago, I found that even though I love the job that I have, it is an overwhelming job in terms of the amount of hours and the amount of things. It just didn't work for me to continue to be the chairman. So, but this is a project that I took on when I, when I was in that role. So um, there, it is divided into all kinds of sections of lots of different things. So for just for credit purposes, Bob and Joan Gaunt, uh, helped with uh, section nine in the tactics section about follow-up. Debbie Prescott, section nine uh, testimonials. Alan Riggs, social media, section 11. She actually uh, did some, some con contribution on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and Facebook. Uh, Michael Streeby on video productions in section 13. Brian Freed, tactics, section 14, local website development. Robert Hurst, a uh, caller from England, uh, did a section on, uh, helped contribute on the email campaign section. And then I did sections one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 24 of the tactics in section nine and 14. So I did write about 90% of this document. Um, but I just sort of, I'm in a role in my real career that I have access and day-to-day -day working knowledge about a lot of this. So, um, but I'd want to make sure that other folks that did help got some, got some note. And then because I'm a math freak, but I can barely spell my name. It took four people to edit this document before we could publish it. So that was again, Debbie, Dottie Welch, Aaron Byers, and Joyce Stent. Okay, so if you've seen it, if you've printed it, downloaded it, this front looks pretty familiar. It's hard to believe that it's actually been, uh, what, six, six years almost since it was publicized. Uh, you know, as I look at the, the number uh, of people that are on this, if you have a question, I see there's one in the chat already. Uh, oh, com just completely new to me. Okay, good, that's good to know. Um, yeah, pop it into the chat. I will try and remember to look at it. Um, and if it's like really timely, I'm, I think we'll have the ability to, to actually stop down a little bit and visit. So, okay. So here's what it has. I, I thought about why a marketing manual and, and the challenge is there is so much material that I did want it to be first and foremost a resource for dancers, to, dancers, callers, dance organizations, caller organizations, uh, to be able to go back to and and learn more and find out more. So we've intentionally tried to make it as comprehensive as we can. It the the first half, as I said, is very much of an of an educational. Uh, really, the whole thing is, is educational in nature. It's easy to maneuver because there's a table of content. And the intent was it for, for it to be a working document, which is why, you know, when you put out a book, you just publish a book. When you have a working document, you put a publication date and a version number. So uh, this is version 1.2. It's the only version that's ever put out, been put out. It was, just, it was published in March of 2018. Uh, a few things, but not a lot has changed since then. So, um, so here's what the manual provides. So there's an education about marketing fundamentals. There is research about the state of our activity and an understanding of the general public's image and awareness of our activity. Some of that information uh, at, at the end of this, I'm going to talk about things that we need to go back and look at and, and possibly uh, do another research piece or update some of this type of information. But, you know, a lot of times you'll hear you, you, you to get where you're going, you have to know where you are now. So based on 2018, there's a lot of, of research about where square dancing was in 2018. That probably needs to be updated. We since 2018, unfortunately, we had to deal with COVID and 
technology changes and a variety of things. So it's pos possible that some of this needs to be updated, but it's fairly accurate. Okay, um, I do defined marketing strategy elements. So when a client is a client of mine is working on running their business, looking at the 10,000 foot level at what they're going to do to market their business, there's a defined marketing strategy exercise that I put them through. And I've, I've made it a little simpler, but basically I've put that, excuse me, into the document so that clubs or dance organizations, if they go and look at it, they can not only learn what target dem target demographics look like. There's a there's a system for them to have a have a, a committee meeting to determine who the ter target demographics are that they want to go after, and then from there, once you have that information, benefits sought, analysis of products that we compete with, how to define a define your specific marketing challenges, and how to develop a position statement. I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail on that today, but know that it, that's important and it's in the document. This is some of the stuff that a lot of people just skip right over. Okay. Brand management tactics. Uh, uh, then there's a large list of marketing tactics with, in, with how to's instructions. In so when I used the example earlier of, oh, I want to use Facebook, you can go to that section uh, and read up more. Uh, I'm sure there's, I, I, I will tell you the doc, document's about 95 pages long. If we really deep dived into how do you use Facebook? How do you use broadcast radio? How do you use all those things? How do you buy them? This document would be, you know, a thousand pages. If there's that much material. But at least each one of those sections gives you a starting point. And then by the time you're ready to dig in and try and use some of those things, you're at least educated enough that you get connected with somebody who really knows about them and can help you. So large system mark, list marketing tactics and how to's for each one. Um, there's a list of recommendations and it's based on, um, you know, how do you, how do you get started? Here's, here's what the, the committee put together and recommend that you use. There are eight or 10 fundraising ideas in there uh, and then there's case studies so these are um, studies of clubs and what they that had success recruiting new dancers specifically and this is their case studies what they did so there's all of that in there okay so this is really more of a statement of the caller lab marketing committee and kind of caller lab in general so in, in addition to the document, our goals are from the committee level we're, are also to help uh, create collateral material, marketing material specifically, um, that you can use in conjunction with the tactics that are described in the manual. So some of you may have been on the uh, uh, one of these interest sessions that Jack Platties was on, and he may have shown you uh, the videos that we've created from Call Out, both the long version and the short versions. Um, Bonnie, is that, am I accurate that he did that? Bonnie. Bonnie. Hello. All right. I'll tell you what. Can, yes, he did. I, I'm sorry. Okay, there you are. Good. You can't hear me, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, I just okay. was muted and I stepped away to get water because I kept coughing. Of course. I know how that happens. That's like, it's always timing. And I can't, I don't, you're not one of the faces I'm seeing on the screen. So sorry about that. All right. Well, good. Um, so that's an example of collateral material that supports some of the tactics within the doc, within the marketing game. Okay. All right. But we also want to be uh, a resource for you to get face-to-face -face training programs to assist local dance groups in their marketing efforts. So as Bonnie mentioned how she went to Caller Lab, she got connected. And I realized she did a lot of this on her own, but somehow that connection, you find people that know things and know what you want to be get education on um, and you tie in. It's, it's part of the reason why 
look, I don't, I don't want, I don't mean for this to sound arrogant. What I do in my expert level in the marketing field, I could charge $200, $250 an hour consulting fees to do seminars like this. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't charge uh, fees to do seminars like this. Um, I have done some of these longer version seminars where uh, I've had a group initially put me in and then I do charge a fee. And I promise you, it isn't even anywhere close to $250 an hour, right? Um, because it's this is also, square dancing is my hobby. It's my passion. It's, I love it. It's, it, it's what I do. So um, that's, part of that connection is uh, that I'm not the only one that's a member of Caller Lab and specifically a member of the Caller Lab uh, marketing committee that has a lot of expertise in marketing and in specific areas. So Bonnie's done a nice job of tapping into some of that. And I would encourage, I, I just want you to know that we want to continue to do that. We want to continue to be able to provide that kind of, of education. So that's uh, over and above the doc. Okay, so I'm just kind of kind of try and roll pretty quickly through here. Before I jump into uh, the next chunk, which is kind of going through what's in the sections, I'm wondering if any of you, how many of you have been to marketing sessions that I've done in the past? Uh, Brian, you have, I'm pretty sure, because I know your face, right? Um so let's, let's see, I'm pretty sure Scott, Sandy, uh, so a lot of you have. Well, a lot of the material that I talk about in those is try, I've tried to pull it all together, encapsulate it, and put something about it in this document. So here's what the, uh, the contents are. First of all, goals and objectives. To, to provide callers, dancers, dance organizations with education, and guidance needed to create solutions to existing challenges for our, for our activity. Um, and we developed at the Caller Lab uh, Marketing Committee, all in support of, of supporting our mission, which is to foster the art of square dance calling and improve caller skills. Um, a lot of it feels like, a, how do we recruit? How do we recruit? How do we recruit? And yes, that was definitely in my mind. So. When you think about it, if Caller Lab's um, mission is to foster the art of square dance calling and improve caller skills, fostering the art of square dance calling means getting more callers, right? Therefore, we're automatically tied into getting more dancers because that's where new callers come from. Okay. Um, on, in longer versions, uh, like the one I did in California, I talked about the marketing bridge, which is a study from um, Harvard School of Business. And it talks about, and I'm not going to go into detail on it, but it talks about these five categories uh, that you have to look at when you're trying to market your business. Uh, it has the four P's and the D. I spend quite a bit of time talking about planning, price, promotion, distribution. Uh, in a lot of the articles that I write for American Sport Edge Magazine and in a lot of the seminars that I do. The zero moment of truth is something that I haven't talked about very much, except in a long, longer format training program. It really is the explanation of why we absolutely have to have a positive and easily accessed amount of information about our activity on the Internet. It's called the zero moment of truth. OK, there are some research pieces. There's a census and trends of dancer population in there, demographics of dancer population, public image, public awareness, and uh, I don't because I don't have it. Uh, it's on slideshow. I wasn't expecting it to go away that fast. Let me go back for a sec. There we go. So. Many of you have probably seen these piece, some of these pieces. I write about them a lot. Um, a lot of the information on census and trends and demographics um, 
had to be created from uh, historical data that we had. Uh, the last any kind of census or demographic profile information that we got was from the National Convention in 2014, I think. So it's it's been 10 years. So there are some updates I think we could do is where I was going, going with that. Okay, marketing strategy elements exercise. So this is something I referred to earlier. There's a more deep dive into target descriptions, determining benefits, competitive analysis, marketing challenges, and developing a position statement. There's actual exercises in there for you to work with your club to do that. So if you jump to how do I use Facebook, but you start using Facebook and talking about something that's not overall in line with what what i'm sorry i'm getting i keep i keep digging in like i want to tell you all about all these things when the point is it's in the manual okay there's a sales and marketing fund i talk about this all the time i talk about the sales and marketing funnel with every single salesperson account executive on my staff i talk to with leadership from up you know that i report to about this if this process is something that every single person has to go through from the point of not knowing what a product is to the point of buying it and becoming a fan. It doesn't matter if you're selling square dance lessons or a cable subscription service or a handbag. You got to go through that process. So I talk about that all the time. I talk about brand management, the creation of the new logo a new slogan and some explanation behind it. The, the um, like I still see to this day, as much as we try, I see the old square dance couple logo used in everything. There's a reason why you should get away from it, go to the new logo, or go to a different logo if you don't like the new logo. But <clears throat> it's kind of irrelevant if the only place we use it is in our own uh, uh, internal, right? We'll go external where we start talking to people that don't dance. There is a reason why you should abandon using this old logo or something very similar to it. And it's in the book. It explains how Live Lively Square Dance was chosen as the slogan. Um, then the next section, section seven, is a national website initiative. I know that uh, and that Jack again was on recently and presented the the new website that Caller Lab created called Live Lively Square Dance dot com or I think it's dot com Live Lively Square Dance dot com. So it's a website that came from this initiative that I built in here. It really is a brainchild of mine from several years, several years before I built this. And the idea was to build out websites. The, the, the challenge is that people who don't square dance that want to go find out about square dancing either have a plethora of old school square dance information out there on the, on the website, which is not or on the internet, which is not an accurate portrayal of what we do. But if they found a, an active club square, square dance site or square dance website, it's it's full of come dance at Buckles and Bows. We dance the second Saturday night at Rock Brook Church. And, and here's our callers and here's our cures. It says nothing to people who don't square dance about what square dancing is, what kind of benefits they get out of it why they would want to to uh, participate so it the initial layout was to design square dance websites that kind of linked together so you would go from uh, like a square dance america was my comp my plan at the time canada could have a square dance canada you could have then the states that would have square, square dance new mexico square dance down into the city levels in Omaha, we have a website called squaredanceomaha.org. Uh, there are several organizations that actually are using this. Um, 
there were some specific uh, rules, regulations, reasons why we couldn't link everything like this. So, got it. So, um, when we got through this initiative, which this initiative is still in the document, what we've done is since that document, we've created a website that is very much in line with what this vision was. And it's called uh, LiveLivelySquareDance.com. And obviously, if you, if you follow marketing, that's the slogan that we're using. So the website name makes sense. I'm going to go past some of this, um, but I did want to point out things like, so the, the closest thing we had before the site that we just created was youtucandance.com. And it was created by the arts. Um, and it covers more than just square dancing, square dancing, round dancing, contra dancing. It has some video demonstrations. It, it, it really was the closest thing. And it was, it was, in line with what I was hoping we could get created. Um, but there's challenges. And, and I think we're going to have some of those same challenges with, with Square Dance, with Live Lively Square Dance. And uh, meaning that only someone, uh, <clears throat> only someone known in the Square Dance community, but it's only somewhat known in the Square Dance community, but it's not promoted to consumers. Now you, you guys, if you've been on the presentation that Jack did about the website, and for the record, it was sort of a dual project, if you will, between Jack and I. I started the project of having the website created when I was chairman. And during it was coming along, we were actually getting close to launching. And then COVID hit and square dancing shut down. So therefore, it made no sense to launch a website when the activity was shut down and that same window caused me to have to give up the chairmanship for work. So Jack Platties came in, to, who was my vice chair at the time, came in and took over the chairmanship. And then he saw these, this project through to fruition. So um, it was kind of a fun project and uh, it was an interesting handoff to have to do. I would love to have stayed and just followed it to the end, but he did a nice job with that. Anyway. Okay. So, Again, you guys know about the website, but the only way we get people who don't square dance to go what to the website to find out more is we have to promote the site, right? So they had the same issues with uh, with you two can dance uh, club listings. We figured out a system, I think, with the new site on how to make sure that that organizations around the country and around the world are uh, able to be found on that site. Um, and then of course, caller listings and so forth, which would go just straight to call up. What else did I say? Oh yeah. The concept. So I'll move on. Okay. There's a, uh, section eight is general, uh, there's generational marketing. So if you're trying to appeal to different generations and I put younger, but I guess it doesn't matter if you're trying, if you're trying to appeal to, uh, a 30 year old what you say, how you say it, where you say it is probably going to be different than if you're trying to communicate to a 70 year old. So it talks about appealing to different generations, about product fit, uh, differentiate differentials between age generations, uh, profiles and music preferences. I, I don't know why I did music preferences. Uh, I think that's probably because I have so much access to audio information from working in, in uh, for IR. So anyway, that's in there. Section nine is no cost tactics. So these are all things that you can do. It takes some work, takes a little effort. Some of them are really very simple. Some of them are just planning, um, but they are all at least no cost. So I have a full list of that. More chats, let's see what I got. Got it. Okay. It's Bonnie. She's popping stuff in the chat. 
Okay. Um, we did no cost internet tactics. I'll just use one as an example. On your email, your personal email, you can create a signature. Within that signature, you can say something about, I, I don't know, I participate in square dancing and love it. Ask me sometime. Put a link in, in your signature to LiveLivelySquareDance.com website or wherever you want to. Uh, or just put the, the, the logo and the slogan, Live Lively Square Dance, as part of your signature. If you do that, whenever you're communicating with someone, anyone, your signature goes with it if you're communicating through email. And you can, without thinking about it, start to increase awareness and put square dancing in the positive light with people that you're just interacting with through email. It's a simple process you set up one time and it's done forever. So I talk about several of those types of, of programs. Social media. So at the time, this was Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Facebook. Again, this was six years ago, so you can bet that has changed, right? There's low-cost tactics. So there's print tactics, business card, you know, there's basic print tactics. Um, yeah, I, I guess I don't need to read the whole list to you. It's, all of it's in the manual, right? Um, video production. How do, you, how do you produce video? Creating and editing a square dance video. Uh, I'll I will come back to that towards the end of this. Uh, internet tactics. So what local website development, paid search campaigns, display campaigns, email campaigns. How do you how do you do those? What are available? Do they make sense? Mass media. So I talk about radio, cable, television, newspaper, direct mail, and billboard. Meeting these are media outlets that meet or reach large, large numbers of people. <clears throat> when we get out of the, uh, the tactics section, we get into uh, management structure. So there is um, recommendations and explanation of, of some local dance organization structures and local club organization structures so that you, you know, have at least an idea of how do you go about setting up a committee? What do I, who should be on it? That kind of thing. That's in there. Lori, stay with me after, and I'll try and answer your questions. Hang, hang on to that one, okay? Um, okay. Fundraising. So this just gives a full list of some fundraising ideas. This is the recommendations piece, which is about setting up a committee, how to review marketing fundamentals research section, with that, how to go through that top part where it talks about, you know, it's, it has exercises. Um, using the marketing, at, uh, the marketing strategy elements. All of that's in there. And, and it follows down you know, what, what your recommendations, what we recommend that you do. Um, decide on what tactics to use. So at a minimum, there are whatever A through L is, that many that are recommended minimum start here. There's not that much to it. There's not a lot of expense to it. There's not a lot of work to it. Um, and then never give up. <laughs> section 19 is the case studies section. And I think this is uh, pretty valuable. If you can see, read about the, the story about a club that went from almost extinct to 140 dancers in three years. I mean, they went from almost done to 140 dancers in their club in three years. Well, how did they do that? So that those kinds of case studies are in there. There are, there are four of them, and each one contains the, what the club did, what their marketing plan was, and the results uh, that they experienced. Uh, those happen to be the four that are in there. 
Okay. Here's where you can get a copy. Caller Lab Knowledge Bait. Um, Caller Lab Knowledge Database, which is callerlabknowledge.org, has it. You can you have search for it. you go and type in what you want. Uh, USDA's website, Bonnie, you still have this on your site under education materials? I think you do. You don't have to answer that, but I, I'm pretty sure you do. Uh, the arts website has it. Caller Lab Home App Office has it. You can probably do a Google search and you'll find it. If you do all of those things and you can't find it, my email address is mike.hogan at cox.net. Just send me an email. I'll send it to you. And right. just so folks know, um, when we post the recording of this webinar, we'll also um, post a copy of Mike's slides so that you'll have them available. All of this content information will be there. <laughs> All right. So uh, Jack and, and uh, I'll give you the short version, hopefully. After I stepped off the marketing committee, I didn't step off the marketing committee after I stepped down from the chairmanship, still on the committee. Somehow, some way, I didn't get connected into their email system that we've set up through Caller Lab. And so there's a lot of stuff that Jack and at the time, Justin Russell, who was the, the vice chairman, and now Brian Freed is the vice chairman, and some of the other, there's a lot of stuff that emails and some work being done by the committee that I'm frankly oblivious to because I didn't get any of the communication and they didn't know that I wasn't in their communication chain. So after I barked about it enough times, I finally barked to the right person. They figured it out. They got me connected and I'm happy about that. So what I did find out is from talking to Jack, because he and I cross trails fairly frequently, he had said that they were reviewing the document. He had different people that were kind of reviewing the document. They were going to make some changes and some updates. And then they would be sending them to me for to review kind of to get, because I have more marketing background than the rest, kind of a, an okay, let's do it. Well, I talked to him at least this morning uh, and he said, basically the only changes that they've made to this document are cosmetic only. So there's no updated content, no real plan on exactly what needs to be updated and so forth. I'm not sure what the cosmetic update was, but if that's the case, then basically this document to my, uh, my expectation is it hasn't been updated in six years. I can tell you that there are uh, look, the four P's and the D didn't change, didn't go away. The marketing funnel did not change, did not go away. Um, yes, we created a website called livelivelysquaredance.org.com um, that you can go to and it kind of replaces section seven. So nothing that's in this document is inaccurate or outdated. There have been several new marketing tactics available that probably should be included. There's probably some research and so forth. So I kind of put, put my list together. And this is where I asked you, if you think of something that, that you would like to see in this document, write it down. I'd love to, see, I'd love to hear from you. But here's some of the kind of the stuff that I came up with. So potential updates. Oh, hold on, I got a chat. Jim, hang on to that. I'm going to come back to these. Okay, potential updates. Here's what I think. The research section probably needs to have be have a good look at it. I don't know how important it is that the census and trends and dancer demographics of dancer population is all that relevant. If you're familiar with the document, you'll see that we've shown a steep decline 
in the number of dancers over the last few decades. And that trend continues, clearly. But it is always nice to have as accurate of information as you can. So I think we could update census and trends of dancer population. I do think the demographics of our dancer population have changed, not dramatically, but I think it would be safe to say, see, that in the last six years, our dancer age, average age, has aged maybe not six years because we do have some younger people, a few younger people coming in. But are we five years older than we were six years ago? Is On average, are we four years older than we were six years ago? Those are just some things that, that could be updated. Um, what, I, what I put in here in terms of public image and awareness, the research that, that created the public image and awareness, public awareness pieces in the document happened in 2002, I think. So, you know, 22 years old. I don't think the image and awareness of square dancing has changed dramatically in those 20 years. I honestly don't. One of the trends that I'm seeing, though, that I think would be, first, I think it's important to know, and secondly, I think it might create an opportunity is, uh, I have a perfect example that happened this week. I hired a new person to work on my sales team in one of my markets who is, she is 24 years old, uh, sharp as a whip. She's been out of college for three and a half years. She's done a little bit of most of what she's worked in is in, she's like the perfect person that would be a little green, but, has the right skills for me to make them super successful in the sales world. Of course, you can't be around me very long without finding out that I'm a square dance caller. And she literally turned to me and said, I don't even know what that is. And that might be surprising, but they don't, many, many, many schools don't teach square dancing in gym classes. And actually, what they were teaching was more 40, 30s and 40s and, and earlier uh, traditional dance. And so it wasn't modern Western square dancing exactly. So I'm not sure if that did us good or not. But the young, a little bit younger group, they don't have a clue what it is. And the good thing about that is if they don't really know what it is, we have the opportunity to help them formulate their opinion and their image of what we are, as opposed to trying to overcome an image that is might be inaccurate. So I think that there could be some more research done in those regards. This is some new research, if you will. We've talked about, in as part of the, the marketing plan creation, what are the benefits that your target audience is looking for? What are they, what's sought, right? We've guessed at it. We've, we've never done any research to actually validate that an empty nester baby boomer is looking for social connection or is looking for an exercise outlet that's not called the gym or is looking for whatever it is. We've never actually done the, uh, the research to find that out. So it's something that we could do. Um, I think we should be talking to these very various demographics and asking them about their expectations and documenting it and actually having actual research that can help us got help guide us if we're going to make tweaks to our product to find it more appealing. It's like how do you how do you tweak a product to find it more appealing? to a group of people without asking that group of people what those tweaks ought to be, right? That's logic to me. So we should have some research that, that says, okay, how long empty nester baby boomers or 30 year old or whoever it is, how long do you think you should be in class? Because you know you gotta learn this. And I've done a small version, a very small version of this. I think we need a bigger version. But the basic 
question is, how many classes do you think you should need to take before you can start going and dancing? Because my research with a small group, that number was 6.6 .6 classes. Now, these are people that don't square dance. But what they said, what they told me is after some of them said five, some of them said 10, the average was 6.6. .6. We expect to be able to go dancing at a dance a lot sooner than after 20 weeks or 40 weeks or 50 weeks of class. Well, we need to know that. It doesn't mean that we can't teach them all the way through plus or all, whatever, wherever we want, wherever, excuse me wherever they want to go. But what it does tell me in that little piece of research is that if, I, if I've never danced before and I take start taking square dance lessons, by about week five or six, as the club that's putting it on, we better start providing them opportunities to go dance and not just be in a class environment. Um, what is the perceived value of a class? What is the perceived value of a dance? Our struggle with money is twofold. One part is we don't have enough people. Big part of it. Second part is we're not charging. Enough. So the more people you have, the less you have to charge. The less people you have, the more you have to charge. That kind of makes sense. So, and if you've heard me, if you've been to one of my seminars when I've talked about this, the, the bottom line is, we have allowed ourselves as square dancers to start dancing in senior centers because we refuse to increase the rate at the door. And what we haven't figured out is that folks who are under 65 won't dance at a senior center. So if you want to recruit somebody into square dancing and you're dancing at a senior center, great. Enjoy your cheap rent. Enjoy your cheap entry fee. Enjoy dancing in your senior center for as long as you can until your club dies because it will it just absolutely will so if we had more money we could afford a more a, a better hall that's not a senior center if we had more money uh if we had more dancers there's all look money in, in the business world it's like money solves everything but I don't ever want square dancing to not be uh, a very affordable activity to participate in. I, I just know that in the last, this same group that I told you the 6.6 .6 nights of class, I asked them two questions. The second question was, how much, if you and your partner, and I specifically said it that way, decided to take square dance lessons how much do you think you would you know what what would be your expectation of what you would pay for per class and the average came out to right 39 dollars a couple per class 39 that was the average there were some that were as low as $25 a night. And there were some at 60 and numbers in between. But they're telling me the non-dancing public sees a value of square dancing in that $20 to $30 per person per night range but it's a sample size of 23. We need a bigger sample. Um, and if everybody who doesn't square dance actually would be willing to pay, let's, let's say in this scenario, $30. Well, I don't know that we need to charge $30 a couple, but we got to charge more than 12 because we could pay our bills. So research would help us to validate what we need to do. And so overall, what are their ex expectations when joining our activity? That could be around when you go to class, what do you expect to have? Is your Are there expectations that they'll have an instructor that just works with their square? Or do they expect that there'll be 15 squares? And 
the more we can learn about what our what our customer or potential customer is interested in, the better we can tweak our product and how we present it to make it more appealing to them. And that takes research. So these are new research ideas. Okay. Here's some other potential updates. Okay, so the brand management logo piece, which is the logo and slogan. I think we need to update more information now since those the logo and the slogan have pretty well been adopted. Now we need to talk about how to use it, why to use it, where to use it. I don't think there's enough information on that. We do need to update section seven about the national website initiative. Um, I listed, I, I took the ones that are already in it, but didn't include them in the list. These are um, social media sites that people use that many of you aren't that familiar with, but it was interesting when I really looked at the numbers, uh, Facebook is still number one. The second part, second most used site is WhatsApp. I don't use it, it was surprised. So there's nothing in there about WhatsApp, Instagram, WeChat, TikTok, which I'm sure you've heard of, uh, Telegram, Snapchat, Reddit, Twitch. Any of you using Twitch? Probably not. <laughs> it's typically a very young targeted uh, social media platform. But those things should be in there. Um, here's some more. Case studies. The section at the bottom that has four case studies, I've got about uh, five or six more fully investigated. I know on the Caller Lab Knowledge website, there are several more. So I think we need to update, get some more current websites. That That's an update that needs to happen. Um, in the I, I'd like to break out audio into an audio section. And the reason that I say that is we don't have streaming or podcast audio. Any of you do audio streaming or podcasting? Well, you might not. You might you just listen to radio. Let's say let's say if you listen to radio, listen to music. Is all you listen to the radio on a broadcast like on a on a radio that sits on your kitchen counter that's got a receiver and you tune it in and that's what you listen to radio on or in your car or on the radio in your car? If that is the only way that you listen to audio, fine. We don't need to talk about streaming or podcast. But if you use, um, right, these are pieces that will go into it. If you use uh, Spotify, or Pandora, who I'm sure you've heard of, or the iHeartRadio app, or a dozen other smaller servers but that are out there, that's streaming. If you if you did listen to podcasts, you'd know about it. I guarantee you the fastest, and I have research course backs it up, but the fastest growing audio listening source is podcasts. It's the fastest growing. But it's not that big. It's big, but it's it's not that big, right? Broadcast radio is the biggest audio media dis delivery system. Um, but streaming and podcasts need to be in there. I think we need to add a whole new section on video marketing. Um, and when I say at, if it doesn't, it looks like a mistype or something. It's not supposed to be. I need to add ad supported audio stream platform. What ad supported means is there's a spot in within the audio where you can put your ad, where your ad can play. So there's a lot of streaming service that offers no inclusion of commercials, which people like, but for a marketer, for a marketer, it means it's a useless product for us. We can't market it. So it's got to be added. And then the last one, is artificial intelligence, AI. It's the big blow up thing right now. Uh, it's not brand new, it's been around a while, but suddenly it's like set its self, set its, uh, self on fire, it's just going. Uh, Bonnie mentioned, you know, maybe talk about artificial, artificial intelligence and how it's affecting the marketing world. And at this point, it's it's pretty new for me to tell you a whole lot about it. 
what I've read and what I'm looking at, um, honestly, I think is way too deep in the weeds and way too irrelevant at this point for me to try and do a section on information you're not going to use and you're not interested in, but it's coming. And so I want to make sure that, uh, that we take a look at possibly adding. So those are the kind of additions that I think we could make to this manual. Um, I would love if you, Mylene, or Mylene, um, Bonnie, if you want to unmute everyone, I can tell you that this is the end of my thing, but I would love to, and we've got 10, 15 minutes or so. I would love to, um, how do I get out of this and back into the Oh, y'all, it's to seeing y'all. Here we go. Oh, there we are. Bonnie is still muted. And I thought I unmuted myself. Everybody needs to unmute yourselves. I cannot unmute you. I can shut you up, but I can't turn you on. <laughs> <laughs> so... Looking at the chat, I thought I would touch on a couple of these things. So, um, all right, completely new to me. The website, Mike's talking about. So, I was okay. trying to put in some of the things you were talking about. I was trying to put them in the chat so people could write them down. Right. Good. Oh, cool. Mike, Mike, this is Lori. I, Hi, I Lori. don't know. I don't, I'm not sure if this is relevant, but I look at the, the live... Uh, live lively site and as yep. i said there's no michigan in the dropbox so i couldn't find anything in michigan but how do how do they um uh get listed i mean how do they find them what you know how is that site find okay. them do you know? so so uh, i'll give you the, the the thinking behind it uh i was not involved in the research to find so i can only kind of speculate which i think i'm educated enough that i got a pretty good idea so here's uh, here was the the thinking on it. Um, in terms of individual clubs and individual callers, uh, we came to the conclusion that there there was on the individual caller standpoint, um, there was the potential to go that route. The uh, then you get into then you get into the argument about well if we had this well. This is a caller lab created and funded site. If they're not members of caller lab, do we list them or don't we list them? And I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't we list every square dance caller that's out there? This isn't about promoting caller lab. And then we started talking about, you know, new callers coming in and, and old callers retiring or passing away or whatever and trying to, keep track of all of that and keep it updated you know keeping that data updated is a nightmare right and mm -hmm. so we think about we think about the local club structure um local clubs change presidents contacts and so forth all the time not as often right. as used to but it's it'd be impossible to keep in and, and then new clubs get started and and some clubs fold and it It sounds like somebody's trying to say something, but it's getting broken up. Okay. Anyway, so Lori, here's what we what we went with. Instead of dialing it all the way down to local clubs and local callers, is we tried to dial it down to dancer and caller organizations. Okay. So the Nebraska Callers Association, which should be able to be found in Nebraska, and the contact information, even if they were the president of the Nebraska Callers Association, and they're not anymore, if you, if they're the contact in there, of course, we want to, the correct contact, but if they don't update us and we don't find out about the change, chances are dramatically higher that if I reach out to Mike Hogan, who's no longer the president of the Nebraska Callers Association, I'm still not going to drop the ball off. Right. I'm going to do something with that contact. So we went to local dance organizations and caller organizations. Um, 
I'm quite sure we didn't find every one of them. So my recommendation, Lori, would be um, I want you to send an email to caller or to uh, director at callerlab.org. Okay. Because we do have a oh, Michigan we do yeah. have a Michigan council, but the state it itself is not in that find list. I mean, I the state is missing and the drop down list. Really? And yeah, you're, you're putting no... off the drop down list for the map that's on the on no, that Yeah, if I go to the site and yep. um I go to um, join groups that find a dance. Join groups and events near you, and I click on state and I uh, state uh, well United States, and I go state and province, and I go down, and there is no Michigan. All right, hang on. You okay if I share my screen here? Oh, of course, right? I, um, yes, please do. I'm, I'm actually politely saying that because I could do that. Because but... I know like when I go to Where's the Dance, um, they've put out a um, request for um, for all the, you know, all the sites that they work in with the Michigan Council. They're reaching out. They mm -hmm. went and did a search to see who's in Michigan. And then they reached out to any club that was in the area and said, please send us any updates, you know. Right. So, Lori, this is where you're at, right? This site, the uh, Lively Square Dance? Yeah, and I went to um, uh, find a dance. So, I don't know. It says, I'm not sure where I'm on. The, I'm on a section that says find a dance. I don't know how. How you got get, there, right? Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I sure how to tell you from that page. Um, right, maybe. Right. No, that's all um, right. It's. Maybe. Um, Oh, there, if you scroll down. So it says um, who, what, where, how. Yeah. Um, maybe I put in search. I'm trying to figure out how I got there in the beginning. Find a dance. That's find, find a, con a contact. Well, you could try that, but that's not what I. Well, this this should take you the same place. Find a contact, find a dance, find a. It's... Okay, then you go down. Yep. And you were and here. Then put, yeah, and then do country and then state, and there's no Michigan. Oh, it's more than that. Do United States of America, maybe. There we go. No, Michigan. It's there. It ain't there. What the heck happened to Michigan? You guys are still there, right? You didn't, you didn't like float there's, off. Yeah, into there's the Great there's Lake. a number. There's a bunch of clubs. Not yeah. as many as there were a little I'm while called, ago. I'm called in Michigan. You uh did oh, this. But what I wonder is, even though there are a bunch of clubs and organizations, when I zoom all the way in on the map, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. identified in michigan and that's so, probably where that's probably where it picks it up and then adds the state into that list so how does somebody get that information to to be 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 there to get us added <laughs> right email director uh, okay all right at callerlabs.org yeah because there's there's two there's two um square dance clubs and you know, we have other clubs too. We have country clubs too. There's two square dance clubs in Michigan. No, there's oh, there's more than that. There's more. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, there's more, but there, a lot of them have closed. Uh, Carol, how many? How many have have closed so far? A lot. <laughs> a lot. There's a lot. there's more down like Lansing and Detroit area. There's not mm. two. Well, there's a couple north of. Uh, Grand Rapids. There's one in Muskegon area and one um, for uh, I think Shelby. 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 But most of the other stuff further north is closed. I'm trying to figure out how to stop sharing here. <laughs> I used 
I use Microsoft Teams yeah. all the time at work. I don't use Zoom. Yeah, I know what you mean. So now I'm trying to figure out how in the world do I get on this and hmm. let me click on Bonnie's face. I want to, and Zoom, there should be a green button. That's uh, There should be a, a, a toolbar at the top, and you, you'll see that it yeah, says Yeah, I stop. see that. It should say stop sharing. I got new share. I don't want that. Anyway, um, here, there's stop share. Stop share. Bam. Okay, got it. Okay, uh, I know Jim Masco asks if anyone is anyone pursuing funding funding through grants like the Ford Foundation and others. So years ago, Caller Lab had an organization called the Grant Writing uh, Committee, called the Grant Writing Committee. Challenge with writing grants is it's a real profession. Uh, yeah. You really, you really need to find someone who has expertise in grant writing, and we just didn't have anybody. And if you have somebody who has real expertise in marketing that doesn't square dance, and you want them to come in and and train and do all those kinds of things, you must pay them. Right. So we we never hired a grant writer because we don't want to spend any money either. I don't know because we didn't have money because we didn't see enough value in it. I don't know. We did have a grant writing committee that made a few attempts to to including to the Ford Foundation to get some funding. And we learned our lesson that it is a very sophisticated, very relationship driven, very network type of of um, project as well as um, it's like being in sales. It, if you're actually selling something to somebody that they didn't want to buy, it's hard because you have to connect. You doesn't mean that you can't convince them that they should buy it. The same thing happens with um, with grant writing. So no, as far as I know, we have. Now we we haven't at Color Lab though. Now Jim, we did in the process of setting up uh, one of the thinkings when in the process of setting up the arts, the Alliance for Round Traditional and Square, was to have the ability to put multiple forms of community, social, traditional dance together, giving us a much bigger platform and therefore more palatable for or more attractive for grant writing groups to want to support, right? Philanthropic organizations to want to support. And okay, opinion only. Arts hadn't done anything with that. If they have written for any grants, which is possible. I know nothing about it. But certainly the idea of using multiple groups to, to make that work uh, is it hasn't hasn't worked. So so I don't know, Jim. I'm not I'm not against the idea. I'm never gonna yes. say, oh, let's not do that. But we just need the right kind of expertise and plan to go after. Can I leave the down any took a bump. And in some ways, Mike, that's a perfect segue because our next webinar is Sorry, put it. on by the arts, the Alliance of Round, Round Tradition Traditional and Square Dance. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to talk, I think they're going to delve into a lot of the background of arts, what is that organization, and the website that you were just showing. I think they're going to um, do some focusing on that as well. Um, some of the marketing programs that they've put together. So that is going to be on February 17th. Okay. So that is our next webinar. Um, so I think that's a, a good opportunity that if we've got some of those questions, let's ask them. Because we're right. going to have most of the executive committee of arts as part of that program. Good. Good. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know why or how, if they ran into the same stumbling blocks that Caller Lab did, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's a great opportunity. 
you know, it's kind of like you got to have a plan before somebody will pay, give you money to support the plan. So what's the plan look like? Brian, I've been trying to read your little bit longer te text here while I've been also it's trying to listen. Been so, been <laughs> so at least... Mike, did we lose you? No, I'm, I am reading. That's not me. It's Brian. <laughs> He's getting, you're getting the cycle. Brian, mm -hmm. so if for those of you that haven't read what Brian said, Brian, Brian, you are exactly straight on. Look, look at an organization of a company like Ford Motor Company. Ford has the big scale top line Ford who runs ads and on radio and television and billboards and wherever else they do and have this really cool website and they promote the brand of Ford. And then it tears down into what they call tier two, which is the local Ford associations of dealers. You've probably seen television ads or heard radio ads about the special uh, Valentine's, uh, I'm making this up, but it's an, an example. Valentine's Day special incentive, kickback, offer to support, blah, right? The, the big special that is a Ford initiative, but on a, on a local or a more local basis. And then you have the individual Ford store that does has to do their own marketing as well. So what what Brian is saying is Canada is set up where there's the the organization structure for square dancing is set up national organizations and then some provincial organizations and then down to local club organizations. And it makes sense that some of the high level, how do we build the brand, reach lots of people is managed by the top level of the national organization and then the, the states or in their case provinces can do their own thing and each club has their own their own thing to do somebody needs to help them figure out that that's what they ought to be doing and what they ought to be doing i know a guy <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and not not just me i know lots of people but it it's interesting brian that you brought that up because i look at the united states in that same regard if I'm looking at the United States and I don't know the, the, the setup of organization structures in Canada, but in the United States, what is the single largest nationwide represented, represented square dance dancer organization? It's not a trick question. USDA. It's the USDA. It's you guys. It's Bonnie. It's you, right? It's not you, Bonnie, but you know, yeah, no, it's the organization guess... that you're representing. So, what do you need? What? I, I, I this is going to sound accusational. I don't mean for it to sound accusational, but if USDA is the largest nationwide square dance organization. It's at the top of the food chain, right? USDA should be building out the overall plan and then moving it down to dancers, you know, doing things on a national basis to build the brand of square dancing to make it more popular and more understood. And then the local organiz local states can do their own things and the local clubs can do their own thing. Well, what do you, 
What do you, there's three things you're missing, Bonnie, your organization is missing that keeps you from doing it. Time, manpower. Mm -hmm. Well, time is, man, so maybe there's three or four. You don't have the time, you don't have the manpower, you don't have the expertise, and you don't have the money. Yeah. That's it. You do have the desire. And it's the same, Brian, you might find that across Canada with your national leadership. It is, it's probably the same with the arts. You know, the arts has USDA, Collar Lab, Round the Lab, several other organizations that make up the USDA to try and come up with this big, big group. Well, you know how many people are actually actively involved in the USDA, like as a member and so forth? Hey. It's about 20. Mm -hmm. 20 people can't do this, right? You said USDA and you meant arts. I mean, I meant arts. You're right, Jim. I meant arts. Yeah, there's 20. I mean, maybe there's 25. Nowhere near enough people, manpower, expertise to, to do what, in theory, we would love to see that organization do. And it is a challenge. I mean, that's a lot of why we started this webinar series during COVID is because so many people on the club and dancer level had no idea what United Square Dancers of America is. They don't know what their state organization is or their regional. And we wanted to develop this program to help spread the word and really what it gets down to is those of you that listen in on these webinars need to share what's happening I know Brian has done that through Canada we've gotten several of his Canadian cohorts that have listened in on some of our webinars and I know we've had others that you know we see some new faces every time but if you don't help spread the word it doesn't really matter how much effort we put out because it's got to funnel down to the local dancers to get that involvement. And even mm -hmm. on your club level, it's the officers of that club sharing what's going on. How do you get your local people involved? And it's to help them and nurture them, not to intimidate them by saying, oh, there's a new body that walked in the door. How would you like to be president? You know, let's, you know, how do we, if I'm the president of my club, how do I, show that new person how to be involved without scaring them to death and yeah that's so you know it, while i it feels like i just challenged you the flip side of that is hats off to you because <laughs> you know at least you've done what you can right um collar lab probably is the the forefront leader in trying to do that do and provide education and provide methods and thoughts and all of that and and but on on specifically on recruiting new dancers but most of that is coming out of the marketing committee um certainly how to do marketing is coming out of the marketing committee yeah um the, well and the, the number of tools the that caller lab is providing those, now the, right yeah you know so, that, so that's all there. And, and uh, you know, guys like me have been invested a whole lot of time volunteering to, to do all this stuff because we, you know, at least in my case, I just happen to have by 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 luck or whatever, it happens to be the industry I fell into. And so I know a lot about that and right. it's something we need. So, so we just jump in and you know, and and there are, again, there are a lot of tools available that are out there that are free. How absolutely. many people really know about it? I mean, that's part of our role is to, how do we help Caller Lab spread the word to the dancers across the country that this stuff is available and all you have to do is go out and to the website and look for it or download it, you know, share that information. And that's where all of the rest of us come in. You know, so, they so, offer their expertise and- we're just bantering here at this point. So my answer to you about how do you how do you help Caller Lab to get that done? It sounds like a unified effort 
headed by an organization that both USDA and Collar Lab belong to called the Arts. It would make sense. Now, USDA and Collar Lab can do their own thing. That's fine. <coughs> and if USDA wants to support Collar Lab stuff, great. If Collar Lab wants to support USDA stuff, great. But somewhere, somewhere at the arts level, there ought to be some organization to, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? How can we support each other? And it's just too small of an organization. It's probably one of the least known organizations in the square dance world. And yet it's supposed to be, if you will, at the top of the food chain, right? So anyway, I'll tell you what, uh, guys, I do need to run. I've got some some guests coming over. We're going to sit in freezing cold Nebraska and play cards and have dinner together. So, um, Bonnie, thanks for what you do. Everybody else, thank you for being on here. And I know you guys are leaders in your own areas. So I appreciate that. It looks like Jim had to roll. I don't know. But Jim, Magico, if you're still out there, love to see you, my friend. Um, look, you got my email address, mike.hogan at cox.net. I'm not always Johnny on the spot instantly re responding because I'm busy, 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 like everybody. But I'll tell you what, uh, I don't delete emails until I've react until I've done whatever I need to do with them. So if you send me an email, you need some help. I will, I will help you. And if you send me an email and you need some help tomorrow, put it in the email because it might be a week or so before I get back. But, but do that. Um, Mike, could you say your email again, please? Yep. Mike dot Hogan at yep. at Cox C-O-X dot net. Okay. Dot Thank Hogan you. Dot Thanks yep. for spending the extra time with us. Absolutely. No worries. It's my passion just like it is yours. Once again, I want to thank Mike Hogan um, for doing this presentation for us and for all of you for joining in today. Um, again, our next webinar will be February 17th, um, same time. It'll be the same login information if you don't get it, um, but it is going to be the Arts Dance Foundation. So Mike gave us a good jumping off point. Um, we're going to have a good number of their executive committee on that session, and it's a great opportunity for us to, one, find out what they're doing and what they're all about. But number two, ask them some questions and how maybe we can get involved to help them out, help that organization. So I hope you will join us for that. Um, if any of you are not automatically getting email notifications about upcoming webinars, put your name and your email address in the chat and we will add you to our automatic email notification list. We also, you can always go out to the United Square Dancers of America website www.usda.org and that will give you a listing of upcoming webinars that we have scheduled and um, we also post them on Facebook. I'm trying to get Facebook calendar reminders set up so that you can actually add it to your own personal calendar to get reminders. Um, that's sort of a work in progress but I'm working on that. Um, so again, thank you all. Um, there was a request, um, Brian, I did see your inquiry and I'll do what I can about that. Um, for the rest of you, there was an, a request to stay on that you could chat together. I can leave it open. I am going to personally log off. I am uh, missing a memorial service for my college roommate's mother. I'd like to try to tag into the last of that, but I will leave this open for you guys to chat amongst yourself if you wanna stay. Thank you all so much. Um, Brian, I saw your hand up. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Again, thank I, you. I also all. have to go, everybody. So, I'm hey, Mike, you. I'd like to say thank you, too. Bye. So, nice to talk to you again. Best guy. Or listening to you. Um, <laughs>